Thanks for the cool Okay, cool. Oh no, I guess it's the uh, saying that. Oh, wow. Oh, because that's like another computer that's connected to Zoom. Hi everyone, so I think we should get started. Um, so today's speaker is Boyana Hachiska, who is currently a postdoctoral fellow at Joy at UC Berkeley and also the Florence Berkeley National Lab. Um, Boyana did her undergrad at Princeton and then continued to do her master's at the University of Cambridge and then uh, went on to complete her PhD at Harvard University. So um, Boyana is an expert in anything related to cosmology, and she also had experience with um, cosmological simulations. Um, so yeah, we are happy to have you today. And so yeah, please take it away. And so just to remind for people on Zoom that we are recording the Zoom, so um, feel free to turn off or turn on the camera. Cool, yeah, no, thank you so much for the kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. and. The other thing that I wanted to say is that feel free to interrupt me with questions during the talk uh, or at the end as well if you prefer. Uh, and so today I will tell you about some of my past work and tell you a little bit about my future plans. And in particular, I will try to argue that work on the intersection between extragalactic astronomy and cosmology can offer some of the best insights for some of the biggest astrophysical questions today. And uh, I have it uh, nicely put in this, uh, you know, AI-generated image, unfortunately, of uh, the two, the, the kind of questions that both fields ask. So traditionally, we see them as two separate fields that have their own questions. Uh, for example, astronomers are interested in understanding how galaxies form and how their subsequent evolution is influenced by the presence of active galactic nuclei or AGN and supernovae, and how that in turn can disturb the baryon distribution around them. On the other hand, cosmologists are interested in fundamental questions about the nature of dark matter and dark energy, and also the mechanism that led to the quantum fluctuations that seeded all of the structures that we see today. But I actually think that the better the data is getting, and uh, we see a lot of evidence from that, the more uh, connected these questions are, and the more it becomes a question of how do we integratedly address them in order to solve, uh, to solve these, uh, all of these um, big mysteries. And so my work sits essentially on the middle uh, of that bridge, and I try to talk to both astronomers and, and cosmologists and make progress in, in answering them. And so for, for this talk, I will focus on two main uh, fields, uh, that of the physics of, of gas, that's essentially uh, also called baryonic physics in uh, many uh, circles of um, cosmology and astronomy, 
And that will refer to the gas that is uh, dispersed into the intergalactic medium mostly. And then the second topic will be that of the co um, connection between galaxies and their um, dark matter halo hosts. And don't worry if uh, you know, you're not very familiar with either of these terms. I will try to kind of uh, step back and provide some um, basic information about uh, both fields. Uh, I also work on a couple of other uh, questions related to re-cleansing and reionization. So if people want to talk about any of that later, I'll be happy to. Uh, so without further ado, let's dive into the first part. So that's the uh, gas physics. Uh, so one thing you might be wondering about is why is this of interest to both astronomers and cosmologists? Well, for a very long time, astronomers have been trying to figure out how the gas is distributed. And that has been uh, an issue because uh, a lot of the gas is in a diffuse and cold state, which makes it actually very difficult to detect. And so there is this missing baryon problem, which is the case that cosmologically we know that there is a lot of gas, but much of it has not been observed. And then another issue is the fact that uh, AGN and supernova feedback, which have a very strong effect on how the gas is distributed, also affect the galaxy formation. And so uh, that's something that we don't really understand from many hydrodynamical codes, disagree about what, how strong this effect is and so on. Uh, and then on the other hand, cosmologists are also very interested in understanding the baryon distribution. For example, in weak lensing, we know that we trace the total amount of matter, which 15% of which is made up of baryons, and the rest is made up of dark matter. So if we ignore the 15% baryonic effect, that can have a very dramatic effect on uh, the cosmological observables. Um, additionally, many uh, X-ray uh, observables um, are trying to get at the halo mass function. So what is the mass, uh, the intrinsic mass of a given halo, but we don't observe that. And so finding a connection between the observed gas properties and the underlying mass is super important if we want to unravel dark energy, dark matter, neutrinos, and all of these small scale, uh, from small scale properties. Um, okay, and so to make it a little bit less abstract, let me just get rid of the third volume thing. Um, okay. So to make it a little bit abstract, uh, less abstract, I will uh, present to you this uh, tension or this problem, which is common for both astronomers and cosmologists. Many of you might not know what it is, so I'm going to kind of walk you a little bit through this uh, graph. So on the y-axis, I'm showing the lensing signal as a function of distance away from the center of a galaxy cluster or a galaxy group. And so this lensing signal, you can think of it as a measure of the mass density profile. So how is the mass distributed as a function of distance from the center of the galaxy cluster? And to guide the eye, I thought I have, but sorry, just one second. Uh, okay, give me just one second, maybe I am clicking out of this. Okay, perfect, yeah. Um, so I have to get the eye in, indicated where the uh, halo radius stands. So this is essentially what the mass of the distribution looks like inside of the halo, and this is uh, between the halo and uh, other structure that's around it, essentially. And, um, and, and so here is what the tension is. So uh, Alexia Viltot and the BOSS team, a few years ago, what they did was they did a standard analysis of the galaxy clustering, and they used their best fit parameters to make a prediction of what the lensing signal should look like. So that's essentially a prediction on what the, uh, what the uh, purple line should look like, just from cosmological assumptions. And they found that the actual measurement uh, lies below that prediction. So essentially the lensing is low. And that has been uh, a debated issue and people have proposed many different solutions. And the solution that I'll explore for uh, some of this talk is can gas feedback, can the effect of gas, uh, you know, of, of AGN and supernovae uh, explain some of that tension. Uh, so let's see. Uh, before we answer that question, uh, I want to just uh, step back and say a little bit about how we measure the gas distribution in the universe. 
So there are different probes that are sensitive to uh, the barium uh, content. For example, the uh, TSZ uh, thermal sonia which effect, the kinematic sonia which effect, X-rays, fast radio bursts, metal lines, uh, and I'm not going to speak about many of them, so you don't have to worry uh, about the details, but the point is that many of them don't actually measure the baryons directly. They measure a combination of different gas properties. So, for example, the thermal sonia Zoldovich effect and X-rays are very sensitive to temperature, not just density, and therefore disentangling the temperature dependence from the gas density dependence is not trivial to do. Uh, fast radio bursts are a very promising probe, which can measure the uh, gas, gas distribution uh, directly. But unfortunately, there are some issues associated with uh, how much of the signal that we're seeing comes from the gas outside of the halo versus inside of the halo. So there are uh, other issues with that probe as well. And then metal lines, uh, there, we have only found two systems in which we've detected these metal lines uh, very far out from the cable center. So it's a cool way of doing it, but unfortunately, uh, very rare to see. So that leaves us with the KSE effect, which I have suspiciously left out of the criticism. And so I'm going to make the argument that it's uh, the most promising way of measuring the gas density. And this asterisk is to remind me that that's in the halo out outskirts where the gas is uh, more diffuse and colder. So this is uh, exactly this missing barium kind of uh, regime. And uh, so what is the KZ effect? Well, it is the result of the scattering of uh, cosmic microwave background photons, photons off of uh, free electrons or gas that is uh, around galaxy groups and galaxy clusters, which are moving with some velocity relative to that CMP photon. So essentially, it's kind of like a Doppler shift, which leaves a very distinct imprint on the CMB. And here I'm showing a very exaggerated view, but imagine this is a small cutout from a CMB map. Uh, then a cluster that's moving towards us will leave a net positive effect, and a cluster moving away from us will leave a net negative effect on the CMB map. And this is essentially this KSC effect. Uh, so why I say it's uh, exaggerated? Because unfortunately, we can't see those by eye. So what we end up doing is we stack hundreds of thousands of these objects in order to see uh, this kind of um, signature. OK, and so I didn't say why the KSZ is better. Uh, so uh, mathematically, we can explain that by looking at the, at the equation. So the KSZ effect leaves an imprint on the CMB map which is proportional to the gas density or the optical depth. The optical depth is just an integral of the gas density along the line of sight times the halo velocity. And usually when I say that, cosmologists get very excited because halo velocity, of course, is, uh, gives us a way of um, understanding gravity, understanding dark energy on small scales, and all of these exciting things. Yeah, so in some sense, uh, the KZ effect is the product of astrophysics and cosmology. Uh, but the, uh, the current state of the art is such that our understanding of cosmology is actually better than our understanding of astrophysics when it comes to this gas density distribution. And so we can invert that problem and ask if we can get this halo velocity somehow and we measure the KZ from a CMB maps, from a CMB experiment, can we infer the optical depth? Uh, and so this is kind of the measurement that, I'm, uh, that I'll tell you about in more detail. Um, but you might be thinking, okay, but how do we get the halo velocity? That's not a trivial thing. Uh, yes, that's true. But for many decades now, people doing baryon acoustic oscillation analysis have been relying on the fact that the universe behaves like a fluid on very large scales. And so we can sit, solve the continuity equation Using the gas, uh, sorry, like using the galaxy positions to track the uh, this fluid on large scales, and that allows us to uh, get an estimate of the velocity. So essentially, given the galaxy distribution, linearizing the continuity equation gives us an estimate of halo velocity. And then on the other hand, we have a measurement of the CMB from uh, an experiment, and that gives us the optical depth. Um, so why is this a nicer thing to do than many of the other probes? Well, one thing is that because this, this effect sometimes points towards the observer and sometimes away from the observer, when we do the stacking, we actually end up canceling a bunch of unwanted effects. 
So anything that has a guaranteed positive contribution, for example, the uh, cosmic infrared background, so that's the emission of dusty galaxies at high redshifts, or, or the thermal synapse of Dovich effect, all of these cancel out when we do the stacking. And additionally, the fact that here we have an, a linear density uh, relationship actually makes it much easier to detect uh, variants out, to the, uh, out into the outskirts. Uh, and again, this is uh, circling back to this missing variant problem. Uh, okay, so now that we've uh, covered the basics of the KZ theory, I wanted to tell you about the um, measurement that I led along with uh, a, few a couple of graduate students uh, at Stanford and, uh, and UC Berkeley, and also two senior uh, staff scientists at both of these places. And uh, the other main characters in this story are the DESI Galaxy Survey Experiment and the ACT CMP Experiment. And so let me introduce you to those uh, characters as well. So first of all, what are galaxy surveys? There are these um, large data sets comprising of millions upon millions of galaxies uh, that allow us to create these beautiful three-dimensional images of the universe and understand the underlying physics or try to reveal the underlying physics. Uh, and DESI is a collaboration that I'm part of, which today actually uh, marked the day where we uh, covered 40 million spectra. And that, to put that into perspective with previous surveys is a factor of uh, five or six, uh, where you combine all of the previous surveys, all of their measured uh, redshifts, and DESI has already measured more, more than those, and much more cheaply than, than that too. But that's a different story. Uh, and so for, for this particular uh, question, we care about uh, bright galaxies, heavy galaxies, and so we are interested in the so-called luminous red galaxies or LRGs. Um, and specifically for that sample, we have a factor of 10 improvement compared with, uh, say, a Sloan Digital Sky Survey or SDSS. Uh, okay, and so the uh, other uh, character here is the CMB experiment Atacama Cosmology Telescope in the, the desert in uh, Chile. And uh, uh, here I am comparing it with the uh, well-known Planck experiment. So I'll, I'm just going to flip between the two a uh, couple of times. And what you can notice is that while in the Planck map, we really didn't, uh, weren't able to see many of these kinds of uh, point sources here, uh, they uh, actually show up in the, in the ACT measurements, which are much, much more higher resolution. And this is indeed exactly what we need for this uh, KSZ measurement, because we need to resolve the uh, scale of a halo. So we need a very, very high resolution. So by the way, just uh, for your own uh, peace of mind, the blue dots here correspond to the thermal SZ effect, which sometimes is visible by eye. And the red ones correspond to very strong AGN of nearby galaxies or dusty star forming uh, galaxies as well can leave uh, these kinds of uh, strong signals on the CMB, which we typically mask. Um, okay, and so uh, let me now show you what this measurement looks like and try to explain why I think it's very important and interesting for perhaps many of you as well. Um, so on the right side here, I'll be showing the y-axis as essentially the cumulative baryon profile, or uh, as a function of distance from the center of a galaxy group or a galaxy cluster. And so what does that mean? If you have a cumulative profile as a function of distance from the center, that means that the more you move to the right here, the more you actually encapsulate from the gas mass of a given object. So as you move further and further away, you expect things to essentially flatten out since you have encapsulated everything inside. And just to demonstrate that point, here is the dark matter profile. So that comes from simulations. That's not an actual measurement, which has been rescaled by the baryon fraction so that it can be on the same scale as the gas uh, profile, which I'll show in a second. And indeed, once you move out of the video radius, which is shown in this uh, dashed line here for a typical DESI luminous red galaxy, which has a mass of 13.5 solar masses and redshift of 0.6, you see that this profile more or less flattens out. Uh, so most of the dark matter 
is uh, located inside of this uh, inner region uh, within the video radius, as one would expect. Okay, and so what about the gas? So now that's coming from the actual measurement that is using the DESI and ACT data and combining it. And it has the current highest signal to noise of any measurement made to date. And, uh, and the bottom line here that I want to stress is that, first of all, there is a big gap between what the dark matter is doing and what the gas is doing. And so that means that a lot of the gas is actually not located inside of the video radius, but it's actually located outside of it. And if we pay particular attention to the video scale, we see that there is a factor of almost four or five. So indeed, a lot of the gas is, is pushed out. Uh, and so it's not the case that uh, the barriers have disappeared as uh, the missing burial problem has posed uh, so many decades ago. They have simply been pushed out to the outskirts because once we move away sufficiently uh, away from this, uh, um, from this video radius, we recover the, uh, the thing that we expect from uh, just uh, the baryon um, co co content in the universe. So, so that's uh, one of the things that I uh, am, was very excited about. But then you might think, you might ask me, okay, what is happening here? Why is the gas behaving in that way? And uh, many of you know that the obvious answer is, well, there is feedback, and feedback is pushing the gaps uh, outside of the video radius. And then, okay, we know that feedback is something we should care about. Can we uh, predict that from a hydrodynamical simulation? So what if we now compare this to the state-of-the-art hydrodynamical simulation in luscious TNG? And so that's this dashed line here, which I'm putting a band around it with a very conservative measure of the errors uh, in our assumptions of how we select galaxies and how we treat a luscious TNG as the, um, as the DESI equivalent. And what you will see is that a gap continues to exist. So our measurement of the gas and our measurement of the gas from the simulation, so from observations and from simulations, continue to be discrepant. And indeed, uh, the, uh, the simulation simply does not have uh, enough uh, feedback. So that's uh, a question that I'm very uh, interested in. And, uh, I think will be uh, important to explore uh, for many um, relevant questions regarding, for example, lensing. So, uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, what is the uncertainty, uncertainty band here for illustrious? Is that yeah. just from different Great. simulations? Great question. So, uh, unfortunately, in these kinds of simulations, they're so expensive that we only have one of them. Uh, so, what we did here was we took the simulation and we made an assumption of how how to select DESI galaxies, how to extract DESI galaxies from it. And then we said, okay, but we might have made a mistake. You know, there are some convergence issues with the simulation, so we can't just trust them blindly. So let's vary a bunch of different things. So for example, let's vary the satellite fractions, let's vary the number densities, the cable masses. And it turns out that uh, the amount of, you know, error that you get from that assumption still, you know, uh, shows that the two curves are uh, in disagreement. And in fact, if you notice, the y-axis here is logarithmic. So uh, in fact, if you're showing this in linear scale, it looks even more dramatic. Yeah? I was just wondering if you could comment on um, the role of the timer interactions. You know, so when, when galaxies merge, there's a whole spray of stars and different things that redistribute. Right, right. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's a very interesting question. And uh, I, uh, to my knowledge, a lot of these uh, hydrodynamic simulations have, you know, subgrid models for how that works out. But, you know, it, it's whatever the assumptions are, they're going to be in that delicious TNG uh, curve. So uh, if you have, for example, any ideas of simulation that might be better at accounting for this, it would be interesting to comparison to it. Presumably this, this inherently yeah, accounts for that as well. <coughs> right, exactly. That's yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, right. And so okay, and so let's go back to that question of the lensing is low tension. So I mentioned that it could be the case that uh, some of the solution is due to the baryonic uh, distribution. 
Uh, so what if we now essentially account for the variant effect on this measurement? And let me just uh, pause for a second and say that that's not something that is uh, optional. We know that variants are at least 15% of the total matter budget, so they do have to be taken into account in these kinds of measurements, and they have been, uh, that, that hasn't been done very robustly in the past. Uh, okay, so doing so, we get this yellow line here, and uh, what you will notice is that the tension is now reduced by about 50%, which is indeed quite nice. Uh, means we have half, like, you know, we have less work now to do as theorists in trying to explain this tension. And, uh, and uh, in fact, it is not only the case that this is important for tensions like this, but overall, on small scales, we know that there is a, a lot of kind of um, model dependence of, uh, or, or rather, there is a lot of um, correlation between the effect that variants can have on the lensing uh, as well as the mass of neutrinos or dark matter models. So it's really important to disentangle that. Um, and some of you might have heard about this low sigma eight tension where this sigma eight parameter, which is a fundamental cosmological parameter, is measured high or measured high by CMB experiments and low by uh, weak lensing experiments. And so I'm interested in seeing how much of that can also be attributed to, uh, to these baryonic effects. Uh, and in fact, I have one teaser slide with uh, current ongoing work in trying to see whether this KSD measurement, which gives us the gas distribution, can uh, allow us to explain the sigma intention. And so let me just introduce this plot very quickly. So um, the, uh, right, uh, sorry, the y-axis is showing the uh, ratio between a universe with variance and a universe without variance as a function of scale. And because this is a Fourier um, observable, uh, this is a Fourier measurement of the power spectrum, uh, the large scales here are shown on the left and the small scales are shown, are shown on the uh, right. And this white line is showing us how much feedback is needed in order to explain the sigma eight tension, how much baryonic feedback would we need in order to explain this tension. And so what we did was we took that measurement and we plotted it uh, with respect to this previous curve and uh, to see whether we are close uh, to it. Uh, and in fact, we see that it's, uh, it's, it's getting quite close to this white line here. So part of it is possibly explained by, uh, by uh, variant feedback. So that's, for those of you who are uh, following this kind of tension, that might be something of interest. Um, okay, but so if we look at this previous graph that I showed, there is still a gap remaining. So what could be going uh, wrong there? And so for the rest of the talk, I'll try to um, argue that perhaps some of it is uh, also due to how we model galaxies and not just uh, baryonic feedback. Uh, okay, so that's the galaxy halo connection part of the talk. And I'll step back and just, uh, yes? So just before we move on, just one question I mean, this is quite a number of skill, right? I'm just wondering, like, how do you get the quality of the right? Does that mean that you get the quality of the loss of the halo ice ash numbers? That's a good question, right? So, uh, right, so basically the halo velocity has a small scale contribution and a large scale contribution. And what we care about here is uh, mostly the large scale contribution, which uh, makes up more than half of the, of the velocity, um, of the build velocity of a halo. So uh, in some sense, you're, we're saying, okay, uh, there is a small scale component, uh, and we're going to measure from we're going to do this stacking weighting by a large scale component, and this difference is only going to reduce the signal to noise of our measure. So, uh, for the second story, it's like those plots you show for R, right? R is like, like 10 microparsecs, I think, roughly, those k scales, like 0 to 6, right? That's like the right. very number of scales. But the halo velocity is, um, is sorted by huge scales, right? Like it's sorted, it's sorted by things on very, very large scales down to very, very small scales. And so we're using the large scales and we're saying the small scales, we are introducing some error, but it's uh, only going to decrease our signal to noise and we're happy to pay that price. If we had a better way of getting the full velocity, then that would uh, you know, increase our signal to noise by at least half, but uh, by at least a factor of two, not half, yeah. <laughs> cool. 
Yeah, no, but uh, that's a great point, yeah. Uh, okay, so stepping back for a second and just talking about the importance of the galaxy halo connection in cosmology. So what do we usually do uh, when we uh, find ourselves uh, using some galaxy survey uh, or some data set that comprises of a bunch of uh, galaxies? Well, typically we measure some kind of summary statistics on it. For example, the two-point correlation function, which I will be referring to as simply the clustering uh, in this talk. And again, to those of you who are not familiar, uh, on the y-axis, I'm showing the uh, basically number of pairs of galaxies uh, normalized in some uh, fashion as a function of the distance between each pair of galaxies. And uh, again, to guide the eye, um, all of the, everything that's to the left here comes from pairs of galaxies within the same halo, and everything to the right comes from pairs of galaxies in two different halos. Okay, and so to make sense of this, we also need a theoretical prediction for what this curve looks like. So that typically comes from an n-body simulation or a gravity-only simulation. And uh, in that gravity-only simulation, we don't have galaxies. So we need to uh, assume some kind of uh, painting technique, galaxy painting technique or galaxy halo model that allows us to take the dark matter simulation and transform it into a galaxy uh, full, uh, something that has galaxies. And additionally, that kind of simulation will also assume something about the cosmological parameters. Okay, and so having this fake galaxy uh, observable, we can measure the same statistics on it and uh, get another curve, uh, say this orange curve here. Uh, and then in order to do inference of it, be it cosmological inference or astrophysical inference, we can vary the parameters until the clustering between the two matches, and then uh, that will give us some hopefully useful information. Um, and uh, in fact, the questions that, that we are usually interested in here at these scales of say uh, 10 or 20 megaparsecs are understanding, for example, whether dark energy behaves as a cosmological constant or if it has some kind of uh, dependence in time, uh, and whether general relativity obeys the rules that we expect or whether there is some kind of modified gravity component. Um, so that's the typical way that we do this analysis. Uh, and what happens if we, instead of using data here, we substitute the data with a uh, hydrodynamical simulation? So for those of you who are not familiar, hydrodynamical simulations are simply simulations that actually put into them gas physics, galaxy physics, dark matter physics, and everything, um, and are not agnostic as, as an embody simulation, which doesn't have anything else. And so what are the benefits? Why would we do that? Why would we want to substitute our data with a hydro simulation? Well, because in a hydro simulation, we know the truth. So we know exactly where all of the gases, all of the dark matter, all of everything. And we also know the underlying cosmology because we ran the simulation. Uh, and so we can use that simulation essentially as testing ground of how effective and how accurate these kinds of galaxy halo models are. And that was basically my thesis, uh, my PhD thesis was exactly that. Uh, okay, so, so let, let me demonstrate, uh, yeah, so uh, before I demonstrate you, I just wanted to uh, say that I'm working currently with this Millennium TNG simulation, which I'm very happy to be a part of. It's currently considered to be a very realistic, large volume uh, hydrostatic simulation. We say the most realistic, but that's up for debate. Everybody says that, and I know there are a lot of people here working on um, very, very realistic simulations as well, so I'm not going to make that contentious claim. Uh, but uh, what we mean is that it can successfully predict a number of nice observations, uh, and, uh, and, and, and but it wasn't calibrated on specifically. Uh, so for those of you who are wondering, okay, why don't we just use hydro simulations for everything? Why do we have to even use embody simulations? Well, the answer is because they're prohibitively expensive to running the large volumes that we need and for a, a large number of cosmological parameters. So unfortunately, we can't really use them for that. But what we can use them for is testing these galaxy painting techniques. Uh, OK, so I will show you two examples of, of testing these kinds of uh, models, where in the first one, I will try to argue that understanding galaxy formation better can help in cosmology. And in the second example, I will argue the opposite, that actually understanding cosmology can help us understanding galaxy formation better. Uh, so let me start with the first example. Uh, 
Um, so again, another uh, slide that will hopefully bring us all to the same page is introducing the standard galaxy painting technique. So this is the so-called halo model. And in the halo model, we assume that we have some kind of spherical, roughly spherical dark matter halo uh, of some mass. And inside of that halo, there is a central galaxy and it's uh, uh, surrounded by satellite galaxies around it. And the assumption is that the uh, number of galaxies inside of that halo depends solely on the halo mass. So that's the kind of standard assumption. And uh, one can typically write some kind of empirical model where uh, we're trying to predict the mean number of galaxies as a function of halo mass. And then given any halo in the simulation, we can read off what is the mean number of centrals that we expect in it and what is the mean number of satellites that we expect in it, uh, that we expect in it. And once we have this mean uh, number of galaxies for each halo, we can draw from, say, a Poisson distribution and populate our uh, dark matter simulation with galaxies. So that's kind of the whole logistics of um, how we do our modern ways of interpreting, say, DESI and other large-scale surveys. And uh, if we now compare that standard method, which is now shown in green, with the Millennium TNG output of the galaxies. So this is uh, essentially what we consider to be the truth, is this uh, orange line here, and the standard method is shown in green. We find that there is a 15% difference on large scales, uh, or scales of about 10 megaparsecs over H, between these two, um, be between these two um, curves. So essentially, the standard technique uh, falls short of predicting the um, the uh, truth that is given in this uh, hydronarchal model. And you might be thinking, okay, but 15% is not that big of a deal. You know, in some fields, 15% people are happy. Uh, for us, it's actually a pretty big deal because the error bars on these uh, correlation functions with DESI are currently at the 0.1, 0.5% level. So it's a really uh, big uh, deal, unfortunately. And if we don't address uh, this kind of bias, it can uh, lead to issues in our inference of the cluster masses, so the halo masses, and also of cosmological parameters like the sigma-8 tension that I was mentioning before. Uh, so what can we do? What, what, uh, what is uh, some of the missing ingredient, ingredients in this model? Well, for one, we assume that um, these halos are uh, found in isolation, but in reality, we know that that's not the case. They actually undergo uh, mergers, stripping, quenching, cannibalism, and a bunch of uh, other uh, exciting um, interactions. And uh, so, uh, and so, what I was thinking as a PhD student was, is there a way to uh, encompass all of these kinds of interactions in one single parameter? Um, it's nice to, to only have one uh, additional parameter because in these huge analyses, you benefit from having something that's fast and that's not really complicated. And so that one single parameter that I came up with was the uh, environmental uh, dependence. So essentially, uh, can we say that all of these mergers, stripping, quenching, and so on, are simply a function of the environment in which the halo is located? And, uh, and, and to, to quantify that, uh, we propose this uh, anisotropic pooling parameter which depends on the tidal tensor. So essentially, just to quickly guide you in this equation here, so uh, if we take the tidal tensor, which is expressed over here, uh, it's, uh, it's something that we can define at each point in our galaxy, uh, sorry, in our simulation, uh, and then we uh, find its eigenvalues. We can compute this quantity Q uh, which essentially, if it's large, it tells us that there is a lot of pulling, a lot of stretching uh, happening in that uh, location, uh, and, or a lot of compression. So it's just telling us that there is some kind of anisotropic interaction. And if it's close to zero, then it's telling us that there is none of that happening. So it's basically something that's left in peace. Yeah. I'm wondering that low standard entropy yeah. can already calibrate the SDS and its so, all of these already Well, why do you say that? I, uh, I mean, I mean, like, that you calibrate the real oxygen so, so you 
Like but the only, Russian Russian Russian. Russian. but the only thing that they're calibrating it on is the one one point statistics. So they're saying, okay, say that we have the luminosities of all of the SSS galaxies, and then we have say the simulation with all of the masses, and then we do say an abundance matching of some sort without ignoring any of these uh, environmental effects between the two galaxies or more. And I also categories mm -hmm. not well, but, but that's well, right. But also, that's the that's the point with this lensing is low tension. So basically, the statement there is that yes, you can always match the clustering. So if 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 I just change the uh, mean cable masses, I will raise the clustering and I will perfectly match the observations. But then any prediction on another observable that I make will be biased. So this lensing is low tension, as I will try to argue in the next black slide, I guess is uh, exactly um, you know the fact that we are matching one type of observation say the clustering the two point uh, the two halo clustering but then we're mismatching other observables yeah yeah no but yeah in principle you can match it yeah, yeah. but you'll be screwing up other things uh, so yeah and uh, okay so then if we take into account this kind of an isotropic effect then we can match this. Oh, and let me just, um, yeah, to, to your point. So um, I should mention here that when we make this um, this kind of uh, standard method prediction, here we're just using this uh, HALO model without trying to match the clustering. And uh, yeah, and, and here when we do this anisotropic pulling, we're doing the same thing. And it just turns out to be the case that the prediction actually ends up matching the simulation better. Yeah. Uh, okay, so then you might be wondering, does this work in, in reality? Does this work in data? And so we are back to this lensing is low tension or the lensing is low problem. And uh, here I'm showing the standard method, which uh, again, uh, just to reiterate, so this comes from taking the galaxy clustering, matching it with the halo model and making a prediction on another observable, which in this case is the lensing signal and finding that this prediction is actually off from the true measurement of that second observable. And so if we take into account this hydrodynamical model uh, that, that, we pre uh, that, we, um, that we presented in, in the previous slide, uh, a collaborator of mine, uh, Sandy Yuan, basically showed that uh, you can indeed reduce the tension again by about 50 or 60 percent. Uh, so that's really nice because it's independent from this first part of the talk that I was telling you with the baryonic effects. Uh, so indeed, you're, uh, you're, you're making your problem easier uh, in both of these ways. And now the question is, what if we combine both of these? Would we actually fully explain this tension? And so I, uh, you know, there are a lot of people who are working on this, and hopefully we'll soon have some results. It became a very crowded field uh, somehow, but you know, it's Kind of interesting. Um, okay, and so the second uh, point here is about the formation of uh, blue galaxies. Uh, so blue galaxies make up the largest fraction of all of the objects that DESI is studying. Uh, but it's not only the case for DESI, it's also the case for Euclid, Euclid uh, the Roman telescope, and uh, Spherex, for example, will also have a substantial uh, fraction of blue galaxies. So understanding these kinds of galaxies which make up such a huge number of our, our observations uh, is very important and is currently understudied, or you know, or at least there are not as there isn't as much effort dedicated to blue galaxies as, for example, red galaxies. Um, and so that was something that I was interested in again as a student and now as a postdoc, uh, testing the different assumptions that we make about blue galaxies again in simulations. So what are these assumptions that are made? For example, we say that the satellites are distributed uh, through a Poisson uh, distribution. So um, in, in that previous HALO model slide that I showed you, we just draw the, the satellites from a Poisson distribution. Uh, another uh, assumption that is standardly made is that the central and satellite occupations are completely independent of each other. Uh, so one can treat the two uh, separately. And then the third one is uh, the statement that the satellites are distributed isotropically inside of the halo. So that there is no angular dependence of how the satellites are clustered within uh, any given halo. 
And so just for the interest of time, I will focus on the last point, uh, which is the one about the isotropicity of satellites and introduce to you our test. So uh, in our test, what we did was we uh, essentially um, took all of the satellites in each halo and we erased all of the angular information. So essentially we kept everything else the same, the number of satellites, their radial distributions, everything was kept constant, and we just essentially kind of scrambled them uh, in a way that erased the angular information. And so uh, this is, I'm demonstrating that here in these arrows. And so what, did, what happened when we did that? Uh, so again, I'm showing you uh, this kind of galaxy clustering statistics, which is our favorite in cosmology. Um, and uh, I'm showing what the true original uh, satellite or galaxy distribution looks like, yeah, and what the uh, isotropized uh, distribution looks like. So this is uh, once we did the scrambling. And what you will see is that the, for the red galaxies, they don't care. So they truly are pretty isotropically distributed, as we can see from this, um, from this curve here. But for the ELGs, that seemed to not go very well. So uh, in fact, we see that there is some excess here on small scales. So we do find that a lot of the ELGs live very close to each other. So they, they, are, they have very small pair separations. Um, and uh, in fact, all three of the assumptions that I showed before fail uh, for, for the blue galaxies and hold for the red galaxies. And, um, and, and so one way that we can solve this is to say, what if uh, the blue galaxies can actually form doublets and triplets of, of, of galaxies? And so we pr 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 proposed this model, which uh, gave us another set of uh, predictions here in this uh, dotted curve. And indeed, that could um, help us reconcile this difference. And again, we can ask the same question. OK, this is shown in, uh, in theory. Does it hold in observations? Simulations is different for, from observations. And so uh, a few months after we published this work, I was on Desi Telecom, and somebody showed these measurements uh, here in white, and then this uh, uh, silver line that is giving the prediction of the uh, standard model. And, uh, and they were trying to reconcile the success uh, on small scales. And so we got into contact and we uh, came up with a model that essentially takes into account this kind of conformal behavior. So why is it called conformity? It's because galaxies essentially conform to each other's behavior is the kind of uh, you know, way that we can uh, think about it metaphorically. Of course, uh, it's more about the way in which they're formed. So uh, for example, blue galaxies, uh, perhaps what's happening is they're uh, formed from, these, from the collapse of proto-clusters, and that collapse triggers a lot of star formation. We have these blue galaxies formed very close to each other. They get fed into a larger structure and quickly quenched, but before they're quenched, we observe them as being very close to each other. <laughs> yes, your face. <laughs> no, sorry. Okay. Uh, I hope that made sense. But <laughs> that, that, that was exactly my question. I was coding for like two minutes, so I'm happy to hear those. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, cool, cool. So yeah, so that's kind of uh, my point here is that um, you know uh, using these kind of observables and uh, comparing them against simulations can really help us understand the formation of blue galaxies and. Um, and, and whether they're formed within the, the same halo and filaments or whatever it, it is. And uh, yeah, so okay, let me just uh, kind of cap, uh, you know, uh, cap up this section here and say that uh, so far I hope that I've convinced you that there, there are many ways in which can use, we can use simulations to interpret observations, but also use observations in turn to calibrate simulations. I spoke about the Millennium TNG and the Abacus Summit project, but also DESI and ACT, but is there anything else coming up? Um, yes, the answer is uh, there are a gazillion projects in cosmology, uh, and I'm just demonstrating a few of the US-led ones that I'm either involved in or uh, hope to get involved in. So there is DESI, there is going to be DESI 2, which will pinpoint the equation of state of dark energy at higher redshifts, so about redshift of two or three. There is the Vera Rubin Observatory, which will measure the uh, photometric uh, redshifts of, of millions of uh, galaxies. 
and uh, the Roman telescope, which will do so for hundreds of millions of spectra using slitless um, spectroscopy. And then uh, on the CMB side, there is the Simons Observatory, which is uh, which should be taking light this year, and also CMB Stage Four, which is what I'm involved in as well, and it's called the Definitive Ground-Based Experiment. And so, combining all of these. Uh, we will have incredibly good measurements, but our models, our theoretical models, will need to, to follow through. So we really need to meet that uh, precision with very accurate models. And I think that one of the most compelling ways of doing that is to simultaneously model multiple observables. And I think I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to go into a lot of details about this, but I'm currently working on creating field-level inference models uh, which are based on first principle physics and are, are enhanced by AI on small scales. And uh, so the, um, the reason we want to have these kinds of um, field level models is that they contain all of the information in the field. So in some sense, they're more optimal than, than these two point statistics. And also combining all of these probes can help us break a bunch of degeneracies uh, in our model assumptions. And so uh, I'm currently modeling the uh, gas density jointly with the CMB lensing uh, and also with the uh, optical data from, uh, from um, telescopes. And hopefully, you know, we will uh, have some results soon. I will skip this. I wanted to also mention that I'm working on some FNL primordial number sanity stuff, which I think is of interest to a lot of people here. So uh, if you are signing up to talk to me or if you want to chat about it later, uh, I'll be happy to. And um, yeah, so I'll, I'll just leave you with my summary slide. Uh, thank you. Okay, that was a very great talk. So we have about eight minutes for questions. So, so the, you talked about with the hydro models, you were able to kind of isolate some of these baryonic effects. Mm -hmm. I don't know the details of Millennium TNG, but I do know that you know when you have a large cosmological volume and you include hydro, you have to have some support mechanism by feedback or something like that, or else if you have cooling in that gas, it's going to collapse down too. Right. So how is it that you're, you know, previously you showed some of the results with the lesser TNG right. indicating that you get insufficient feedback from right. the simulations that doesn't blow out as much of the barrier exactly. inside the, into the right. kind of the region outside the barrier where yeah. it is. So how do you avoid that problem with millennium? Uh, well, they unfortunately have the exact same problem. Okay. Uh, right, so essentially millennium TNG is the same as illustrious TNG, but slightly larger volume, like 15 times larger volume. So what day was that? 100 <laughs> parsec box? 200 is the illustrious TNG, and 500 over H is the uh, is millennium. Is millennium. Yeah. yeah. Right, so. But it's um, using the same feedback physics. It's using the exact same everything. In fact, it's, it has its magnetic fields turned off, but everything else is the same essentially. And uh, right, so we, we see the exact same issue there where the gas feedback is not strong enough. But the thing is that it doesn't really affect the galaxy, uh, sorry, the, the star component so much because the stars are inside of the video radius. So uh, most of the simulations are uh, calibrated against uh, galaxy, you know, uh, star component observables, uh, and nobody has really calibrated them against, say, uh, X-ray observables or uh, SD observables or anything like that. And therefore, yeah, they they fall short of predicting what happens on large scales yeah. in terms of the very feedback it gives. Yeah. 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 Um, good talk. Um, I had a question about the isotropic floating factor um, uh -huh. or parameter. Um, so I find it interesting that it so it's quite value because it's actually kind of to see whether it's stretching or compressing. Well, so it's basically, right, I guess uh, I can either look for it or let me just write it. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so it's, it's lambda 1 minus lambda 2 squared plus lambda 2 minus lambda 3 squared and uh, yeah, plus lambda 1 minus lambda 3 squared. And so, you know, you, you have essentially the if you have a very large a value of any of these um, eigenvalues, that means that there is either a lot of 
compression happening, or I guess in this case, if it's large, then if there's a lot of compression happening, and if it's small, there's a lot of uh, elongation happening. And so the bigger that this difference is, the bigger that this Q parameter right. is. So it really doesn't care about whether it's compression or elongation, it simply cares about there being large differences between uh, the amount of stretching or pulling happening uh, in, in all three directions. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I'm just going to ask if you have like any intuition for why why there isn't necessarily like why does it work so well in compression and again stretching seem like fairly different right. systems. So. I, I think that's a very good point, right? Yeah. Um, curious. I think that it works well for different reasons. For, so some objects, for example, you can make an argument, okay, there's more uh, compression happening, there's going to be more trigger of uh, start from, or I guess trigger of punching, and if there's more elongation happening, there, there might be a trigger of uh, star formation. So it might actually work in kind of opposite direction, but simply the fact that you're taking into account uh, the astrophysical effects of gravity on uh, galaxy formation seems to kind of be helping. Um, but I think that it's still an open question, and you know, uh, what does it physically tell us about galaxy formation? And it's just nice that it works out because then we don't have to include a bunch of extra free parameters. Yeah, so that's a good great question. Yeah. Yeah. Regarding the the gas density profile and the dark matter profile, I'm yeah. wondering, I think you show the one right, red shift in like red point six and the bitter mass of like anti-gravity profile. I was wondering if you if you been in different redshift and different yes. uh, area mass uh, things, do we do you see any like discrepancy? That's a great different? point. Yeah. So that's exactly what we are currently trying to do. And unfortunately, you know, the signal to noise, mm -hmm. it's currently unclear whether we'll be able to bend in mass, mm -hmm. but we have been in redshift. And let me just, I don't know, I mean, I don't have time to, uh, I, I probably don't have time to show you anything, but I uh, just showed this to my collaborators. So this is uh, for. Uh, you know, for different redshift bits between 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0, no, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, and 0.9, or something like that. And we are kind of, yeah, trying to interpret whether there is any redshift evolution of the signal and what does it mean if we find any. Uh, yeah, so it's it's a it's a yeah it's a very interesting question. Yeah. 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 Cool. Thank you. Thank you for the obvious explanation of the I was wondering how did, did you model it exactly, like the inertial distribution of the um, satellite, and was there any good parameter? Like, did you yes. pretty much went how to do Yeah, the no, there is a lot of stuff that I'm pushing on the direct here. Yeah, exactly. So we, we did them. Um, yeah, it's, to be honest, it's probably not the cleanest model that we made, but we essentially said, okay. Let's say that in this galaxy there are three satellites. So we're going to take the first satellite and choose whatever location it has inside of the halo. But then the second uh, satellite will have a probability of uh, being either very close to the first satellite or being randomly uh, located somewhere. And then one of the three parameters was this uh, probability. So how likely is it the case that it's associated with the first satellite versus randomly? And then the second three parameter is what is the angle of separation. And yeah, so then, uh, you know, I played around with it. Oh, no, so the desert data is not doing that. They're doing uh, the conformity only between centrals and satellites. Uh -huh. So they're saying if there is a central living in that object already, it's much more likely that we find a satellite. And physically, I think it's the same thing. It's just saying that uh, you know blue galaxies tend to cluster uh, together more readily than red galaxies because they're not yet quenched and are formed together in blah blah blah. Or hopefully that's that's what's happening. I also remember you showed a plot when you had curves, um, so like central versus yes. um, uh, satellite right. function of halo. Yes. Yes. Um, is there any? I don't know. Or red galaxies are massive or not? Yeah. Do you do with the number of central versus like satellites? Perfect. Yeah, yeah. So, so okay, I know I'm like out of time, but like just to finish it because I think it's kind of cool. 
right? So we have the mean number of galaxies as a function of halo mass. And essentially, for uh, red galaxies, we have something like this, satellite centrals. And then for blue galaxies, we have something like this, actually. Um, so they're shifted to the left to smaller halo masses. And also, uh, a, lot of the a lot of the centrals are quenched uh, in this regime. So they actually only show up here, and then they kind of go down. So that's a good point, yeah. It looks different. Yeah, yeah thank you. Well, I think we are out of time. So yeah, this concludes the seminar. Let's thank uh, Boyana again. Yeah, if anyone has more questions, please feel free to reach out to Boyana. We are here to help all. Okay. All right, thanks. Thanks, thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Yeah, so I sound a little bit like right now.